Good morning, everyone. Good morning. I'm Lisa Parker. I'm director of the Center for Bioethics and Health Law at the University of Pittsburgh. And it's my pleasure to continue the collaboration with the Department of Pediatrics, through which we bring to campus a lecturer in ethics each year. The Medeiros Memorial Lecture was established to honor Dr. Donald N. Medeiros Jr. Dr. Medeiros earned his medical degree at Harvard Medical School, where he later served as a faculty member for two decades. He interned at Barnes Hospital in St. Louis and was a resident at Cincinnati Children's Hospital. His virology fellowship at Children's Hospital in Boston launched his career on infection and virus transmission from mothers to their newborns. In 1965, Dr. Medeiros became medical director of Children's Hospital of Pittsburgh and professor and chair of the Department of Pediatrics, and then dean of the School of Medicine from 1969 to 1973. In 1979, he was appointed to the President's Commission for the Study of Ethical Problems in Medicine and Biomedical and Behavioral Research, which was the first commission on bioethics. Upon his death in 1997, in a very warm tribute, his Harvard colleagues wrote of his compassion, his intellectual curiosity, and his constant refrain of, show me the data. Despite his curiosity and his background in viral transmission, because of his death in 1997, Dr. Medeiros would have had no knowledge of the particular health issue our speaker will discuss today, an agent that is known to go viral, that is both infectious and addictive. Social media is a potential health threat that his young patients didn't face. After all, LinkedIn didn't get its start until 2002. Earlier this month, as I was putting the final details on our uh, speaker's itinerary for his visit back to Pittsburgh, NPR was reporting in the background on an opinion piece by the U.S. Surgeon General, Vivek Murthy, and in, in which he called for a multi-layered approach to shield young people from the ill effects of social media, the online harassment, bullying, exposure to violence, exploitive sexual content, even uh, sexual blackmail. Um, NPR and other media summarized the article as Surgeon General calls for warning labels on social media, similar to those on tobacco and alcohol products. Dr. Medeiros may be imagined to exclaim, again, show me the data. He argues that we don't have the luxury of waiting for perfect information to address the mental health crisis among children, an emergency to which social media has emerged as a contributor. But our speaker today will present some of the data regarding social media and mental health. Brian Primack is a Dean and Professor of the College of Public Health and Human Sciences at Oregon State University. His research combines expertise in education, technology, human development, and medicine to elucidate the positive and negative effects of media messages on health. He's a pioneer in the use of media literacy education to prevent adolescent smoking, underage drinking, and other harmful adolescent health behaviors. After graduating from Yale University Magna Cum Laude in 1991 with degrees in English and Mathematics, he spent four years teaching adolescents and studying human development for his master's degree, which he received from Harvard University. He subsequently graduated first in his class in summa cum laude from the Amory Medical School and trained in family medicine in Pittsburgh. Subsequently in Pittsburgh, he served as professor of medicine, pediatrics, and clinical and translational science. He also served as dean of the Honors College, which is how I first met him. And he was assistant vice chancellor for research on health and society. He founded the University of Pittsburgh's multidisciplinary center for research on media, technology, and health. And in 2021, he published the book, You Are What You Click. We were sorry when Brian left to become Dean of Education and Health Professions at the University of Arkansas before moving on to Oregon, but we're delighted to have him back to discuss whether social media gets a thumbs up or a thumbs down for its impact on mental health. Please welcome Brian Primack. Great, thank you very much. 
Yeah, thanks for that um, introduction. And then also for inviting me, Lisa. This is uh, a real honor for me, um, having rotated through pediatrics um, at, uh, uh, well, it wasn't here, but the other children's hospital. Also, many thanks to Savannah. Savannah, I um, she, she she organized everything, and uh, I kept sending her new uh, versions because I kept seeing things in my world that I wanted to add. And so, bless you, Savannah. Um, thanks to to Noel um, for helping organize, um, and of course, the Madeiras family. Okay, so you, you've had just a moment to, you know, look at this slide. Um, I'm not going to give you any more time, right? We're going to have a pop quiz now. Let's just all together take a breath and take a look at that H. Where have you seen that H before? I'm going to count to three. Ready? One, two, three. That's right, the History Channel, very good. Okay, the E, one, two, three. Very good. The first L, one, two, three. Legos, the second L, one, two, three. Lexus, that's right. The, the O, one, two, three. The P, one, two, three. The E, one, two, three. Ego. And, and what, what's their slogan? Lego my ego. Wow, Lego my ego. I mean, that, that's a long time ago, too. You know, it's like, let go of my, but Lego my ego. How many people got that? Yes. And, and how many of those people are uh, disappointed that that's taking up brain space right now? I mean, you have so many antibiotics to learn, right? You have so many conditions, and yet you remember Lego my ego. Um, D, one, yes, Disney. I didn't even have to count there. You shouted it out. One, two, three for the S. Yes, it's Starburst. And, you know, the, the, the reason why not as many people got it is that it's the old Starburst logo. It's not even a current one. It's from about 20 years ago. And then for extra credit, the exclamation point, one, two, three, Yahoo, right? So I like starting with this because it's fun. It breaks the ice a little bit. It's also a little shocking to reflect for a minute what just happened here? I didn't even tell you what we were doing or where these letters came from. And immediately, you all had smiles on your faces. I was looking at you and you did. You had smiles on your faces as you said, the History Channel. Ego. And that is not a coincidence because there is a technique that is used by marketers that is called emotional transfer. When they advertise products, they're not thinking logically. They're not trying to help you think logically about that product. Instead, they are trying to create an emotion, often happiness, and then to transfer that onto the product, hence Lego. That smile, that surprise is not an accident. Surprise is an interesting one. Many, many companies, the, the brand names, not the company itself, not, you know, Altria, which is the parent company for Marlboro Cigarettes, but the brand itself ends with an O, as in Marlboro, as in Oreo, as in Lego, as in Ego. Not a coincidence. 
Because O is surprise. It's discovery. And that is how deeply marketers are thinking about everything that they do. The colors are not accidental. Red and yellow are the cover colors of food and drink. That's why Coca-Cola is red. That's why Doritos are red and yellow. That's why the fries are yellow, etc. Okay, so all of that was basically an introduction to the introduction. We're going to be talking about mental health outcomes and social media. Big deal these days. So I'm going to start with the definition. Social media, what is it? You know, of course, you know the general definition. We don't need to look at that specifically. But what I love about this particular definition is this last thing. The first known use of the term was in 2004. What that means is that in 20 years, from 2004 to 2024 in Rangos, two decades, we've seen use of social media go from about zero people to about 5 billion people. We've seen the average time go from zero to about two to four hours a day, and in some populations, much, much higher. And that is a big proportion of waking hours. What's waking hours? 14, 16, maybe for some of you guys, 22. <laughs> the bottom line is when you're talking about two to four hours, you're talking about a large proportion of time. And frequency, the estimate is 159 checks per day. I'm not going to ask this in the positive. I'm going to ask this in the negative. Who here has not checked their social media while in the bathroom? Okay, I saw one, maybe two. Everyone else is honest. <laughs> no, I, I, I believe, I believe you both. You're, you're, you're honest. You, you've got different habits. But what, what percentage of us check in the bathroom? Is nothing sacred? Now, meanwhile, during that massive increase in social media use, there has been a parallel increase in a number of mental health outcomes. Loneliness is one of them. I like showing this. Most Americans are considered lonely. And look, look, look at the date for a moment. 2016, pre-COVID. A lot of people like to say COVID was the thing that made us lonely. COVID catalyzed. COVID exacerbated. But this was a pattern that we were seeing well before COVID. And I think that that's an important idea to take home. Author's message, author's message, you know. In fact, in England, did you know that there's a loneliness minister? Yes, yes. That means that England has a minister of the treasury, of defense, of justice, health and social care, business and trade, and loneliness. And then, of course, they also have the most important one, the Minister of Magic. Sorry, those of you who are not Harry Potter aficionados and don't understand what I'm talking about. Also pre-COVID, depression was at its highest levels worldwide than it had ever been and in fact, it became, in 2017, the most important cause of disability in the world. It passed back pain for the first time. 
more people were not able to go to work in the entire world because of depression than because of physical pain. Suicide rates had skyrocketed to a 30 year high by 2016, again, pre-COVID. And if you look at this graph that also goes from 2000 to 2016, about the time when we were seeing the increases in social media, you will see that accidents and suicide have gone up substantially. And then you'll see that all the things that we learned about in medical school, COPD, cancer, heart disease, and stroke are going down significantly. And that's good, that's wonderful, that's great. It's just an interesting phenomenon that we're seeing Accidents track with suicide, that's interesting. It's not a coincidence because a lot of those accidents are suicide. And many of those accidents might not actually be intentional suicide, but they're due to substance use, which is often a surrogate for, for suicide because it tracks with depression, anxiety, loneliness, and other mental health outcomes. Were these two things related? I mean, a lot of times, you know, uh, a lot of times things go up together that aren't necessarily related to each other. For example, did you know that there's a strong correlation between ice cream eating and drownings? Oh my gosh. Wow. So is it the ice cream that causes the drowning? Or is it the drowning that causes eating ice cream? No, no, it wouldn't be the drowning that causes eating the ice cream because you'd be dead. So it must be ice cream that's causing the drowning. No, it's a third factor that is related to both of those. It's summertime. In summertime, you eat more ice cream. And in summertime, there are more drownings. Okay, so what about the relationship between social media use and depression. And here we were looking at 18 to 30 year olds. And what we hypothesized here is um, a U-shaped curve. Along the bottom line, we have social media use, the x-axis, in quartiles. One of the reasons why we looked at quartiles is that there's a lot of skewing in this. <laughs> because a lot of people say, oh, I use 24 hours a day. Well, I don't believe you that you use 24 hours a day, but I believe it's very, very high. I believe that you're in the fourth quartile. You're in the top quartile. And a lot of people say, I use none. But really, they use maybe 30 minutes a day. So I don't believe you use none, but I do believe you're in the bottom quartile. <laughs> So this is often why we look at this, because it has some clinical interest. If somebody says, you know, oh, yeah, and you are thinking to yourself, okay, that's quartile four, then that's a little bit easier than a continuous variable. And then we have the odds on the y-axis of having uh, depression. The reason why we hypothesized a U-shaped relationship here is because we thought to ourselves, well, if you're in the lowest level of social media use, you might be a little more depressed because you're not really normative in today's society. You know, you're, you're missing out on some social opportunities, on some informational opportunities. Now, Q, uh, two and three are probably going to be the sweet spot, you know, so that odds of depression are lower. Um you know, we weren't sure if it was two or three. We weren't sure where it was. We were really excited to kind of be the ones who discovered the sweet spot. And then we thought, well, if you're, you know, four, quartile four, they, you know, you're using all day, all night, then you're kind of missing out on things. Uh, no, this is what we found. Not just a straight line, not just a straight line that was highly statistically significant, not just a straight line that ended with people in the fourth quartile compared with people in the fir first quartile of being three times as likely to have depression, but also to have this be basically a straight line, no matter what statistical test you used. 
Okay. But you all are smart and you understand research and you understand that that does not mean just because these two things are together, just like the ice cream and drownings situation, does one cause the other? We have no idea. So, you know, is it that you're depressed and then that leads you to use more social media because you're kind of, oh God, I, I don't want to go out. You know what? I'll just check Facebook. Is it that social media, be, for various different reasons, actually leads to depression? I guess it could other be the other way. I, oh, I wish we did that study. Well, we did. And the reason why you've never heard of it, I mean, one reason is that there's just so much stuff that comes out all the time that you can't see it. The other reason is it came out in December and January of 2020 and 2021. I don't know if you remember, but there was a lot going on those days. There was an election being contested. Um, the, the first COVID shots were coming out. We were so excited about being number one in the news. We were nowhere, you know, like someone from the, you know, Iowa Dubuque Times, you know, contact me. Okay. So we looked for the first time at temporal associations between social media use and depression. We looked at a thousand people. We followed them over six months. We only included people who were non-depressed at baseline. And we followed them over time to see who became depressed and who didn't. Well, depression was rising at such a rapid pace at this time that 10% of that population be became depressed over those six months. The relationship of baseline social media use with later development of depression looked like this. Very similar to what we saw before, but actually curvilinear. And yeah, easy to find temporal associations between social media use and depression. You can uh, Google it. Um, me and some of you may know uh, Jamie from Public Health. Some of you may know Cesar. I know at least one person does well um, from psychiatry. Um, these folks have been absolutely instrumental to all of this work. So it does seem like there is a at least temporal association between depression relating to social media use. Ah. I'm sorry, uh, social media use leading to depression. I was getting a little ahead of myself because I was about to ask the question of what about depression leading to social media use? Well, in that same study, we looked at that. No relationship. Not even a point estimate that was higher, you know, meaning that we were just underpowered. What this means is that it is very likely that there are, um, I'm not going to say causal, because causality, nine criteria, you can look it up, Hill's criteria of causation, but we've already got four to five of Hill's criteria of, quarter, uh, of, court of causation in this particular case. Okay, we also looked at social media use and loneliness. Well, maybe maybe people get more depressed looking at social media, but they're not going to be more lonely. I mean, if you have 700 friends, that's better than having 100 friends, right? No, no. Turns out you feel lonelier. The more friends you have, the more lonely you are. And I guess when you start to think about it, there are actually a number of reasons why this may be true. One is um, the displacement effect. We've all seen this. You get on any subway these days, and that used to be, you know, a way that you talk to people. My parents met in an elevator. In an elevator today, you not only are on your device, but there actually was a sign that says, 
please distance yourself and do not talk. I saw that sign yesterday in the building on McKee Place that I used to have my office in. This is the kind of thing that we see. So social media time is displacing the real social experiences that we are used to. A second idea is that of the highlight reel. The fact that this person on the right is kind of what we all feel like every day. I was just talking to somebody about an Avit Brothers line, peel back the layers and you will find true sadness. We all have anger. We all have sadness. We all have frustration. We don't show that in today's world. We don't show it together in public like this, but we certainly don't show it on social media where we are showing that one picture out of 300 where it looks like we have it all together. Whereas the other 299 times, we don't. But we get the sense that everybody does have it together. Interestingly, you might think to yourself, well, but Brian, haven't we always had this? You know, like, you know, haven't we had magazines and and, you know, there's Peyton Manning on the front and he looks all, and don't we feel bad because we're not Peyton Manning? Yes, but, <laughs> but that's not the reason why social media is so powerful. Social media is actually more powerful than traditional media. Why? Because when I look at Peyton Manning, I don't say, gosh, darn it, Brian, why don't you have a quarterback pace, uh, rating of 120. Why haven't you won X number of Super Bowl rings? It's just not even on the radar for me. But when I see people my age saying, oh, I just finished a marathon. I just did a 5K in 16 minutes. I naturally compare myself to those more, people that are similar to me. It's all part of theory of planned behavior. You want to dig into the uh, public health literature. So this picture on the left is even more influential to me than a lot of traditional media. Okay, third idea. Our brains. This is what our brains have been used to for the past couple million years. This is what our brains see today. Just look at the two in terms of color for a second. There aren't a lot of reds in nature. There are some berries, but there are not a lot of reds. When the sun sets, there's a little bit of orange. There's a little bit of pink. There's not the deep red that we have today. The blues are also kind of muted. You know, famously, there are not a lot of blue foods. You know, there's a, an eggplant, which is kind of purple. There's blueberries. They're small compared to the rest of the bush. You've generally got greens and you've got slight light blues. That's not what you have today. That's just the color. I'm not even talking about the cars and the smog and the pollution and the, you know, and the concrete, which we also obviously don't have here. I'm not going to go through all the differences because that would take the rest of the talk. Now, you might say, well, Brian, you're cherry picking. That's New York City. This is Bloomfield. You know, and, and, and I picked a picture where there's no people. So it's not even that you've got this big crowd. It's just the color. It's just what we're exposed to when we were used to something totally different before. What about when we go inside, though? This is what we see. Screaming. There's no other way to say this, but screaming red and yellow. Because remember what I told you about red and yellow in food? Very, very different from this. No matter where we are, 
no matter what we're doing, if we're outside or we're inside. Fortunately, we have a little bit less here. They tastefully designed it so that it would look a little bit more like the trees. Thank you, designers. <laughs> Fourth, multitasking. Our brains are just not ready to multitask. See, like that's the multitasking. You're trying to listen. It's not your fault. You know, thank you. You're saving lives, you know, so I'm not. But but that's the thing is like we're trying to listen to a lecture, but we've got other responsibilities that are going on at the same time. I don't blame those of you who are also looking down at your device every now and then because you've got so many things to do at once. I did it too. Here, we didn't multitask. You killed the deer. You were focused on killing the deer. You brought the deer home. You were focusing on bringing the deer home. You weren't killing another deer. That deer was enough. You brought the deer home. You were focusing on skinning the deer and getting it ready. You weren't doing a whole lot else. Here's some perspective. Let's say that this arrow is now. Let's say that this era was when we became Homo sapiens. There's a matter of debate, but we're just going to go ahead and call it a couple million years ago. This is when we found the first arrowheads. This is where humans crossed the Bering Strait. This is the Fertile Crescent. The Fertile Crescent between Tigris and Euphrates Rivers, Mesopotamia, where we saw the first city-states. Now let's take that little tiny piece between the Fertile Crescent and now, that piece in green, and let's expand that. What about within that period? This is where the pyramids were built. This is where ancient... Greece was at its height. And that tiny little difference is when we had social media. And, and actually, we didn't have Instagram at that point. We had MySpace. <laughs> Does anyone remember the dark ages when we had MySpace? So that tiny, tiny difference, even when we're just looking at that little tiny green area. What this means is that our brains just have not caught up. But fortunately, we're in a world where now we finally got a lot of op opportunities to meditate, to, to, to recharge. We've got pages and pages of apps helping us meditate. I love all of these, but particularly I love in the middle column, the third one down, Buddhify. It's kind of combining Buddha, meditation, on peace, quiet, with Shopify or Spotify. I'm going to Buddhify today. I'm going to sit down and I'm going to meditate better than anyone. And we see a lot of that. We see people dressing for meditation and buying the right cushion and, and buying all kinds of stuff and gongs and bells. And that's not what meditation is about. We don't meditate to become better meditators. We meditate to live better. But that's not what we see. What we in our society do is we take even the most simple idea and we turn it into apps so that they make us money. I'm not blaming any of the people who create these apps. Thank you. But my suggestion, if you're starting out meditation, is none because that is what you're gonna have during that moment of anxiety 
when you're not sure if your swan gans catheter just punctured something. You're not going to have Buddha talking to you in your ear. You're not going to have tinkly sounds of anything. You're going to have yourself. And that's it. I fell into all these traps, by the way, which is the only reason that I can talk about it. That's one page. This is the second page. I could go on to the 10th page, but we'd be here all day. So I'm just going to... and. I have to add one more to the irony list. I mean, they all are in some ways. Middle column, the very bottom one. Unplug. But plug in your ears. Plug in the device so that that device can help us unplug. We do this a lot, by the way. We've got lots of obesity apps which help us sit and look at the obesity app. We're getting farther and farther away from this. Ironic? The best sleep apps for a restful night every night. Same deal. Now, I want to point out something that I think is important. Anyone hear about the blue light, red light thing? Yeah, I'm seeing lots of hands. I'm seeing lots of nodding. Doesn't matter. Doesn't matter at all. Research has shown that this is a nice theoretical, conceptual thing that, you know, okay, your pineal gland, it goes to sleep when you see the oranges of the sunset but when you see the blues of the sunrise that tells the pineal gland to keep you awake turns out in real life that theory just doesn't hold in today's society for various different reasons that i won't go into that was mostly propagated by the industry so that the industry because that was a problem that the industry could fix by changing your blue light to slightly orangey more light in the evening. So then you have the sense that, oh, okay, I'm fine. I'm fine. I can, I can you know, do this all night, but I've got orangey light. Yay for me. That's not the way it is. So we did the sleep study. Um. Jessica Levinson led these. I don't know if you know her, but she was a sleep researcher here. And same thing. The more you use social media during the day, not even in the 30 minutes before going to sleep, she followed this up with another study in the top sleep journal, Sleep, that showed that the last 30 minutes of the day are as powerful as the entire rest of the day combined, but that both are important. Both are independently associated with poor sleep. So what ends up happening? We're anxious at work. We're overwhelmed at work. We're multitasking at work. And then we go shopping on our way home. We're overwhelmed with shopping. We're confused. We don't know what the best thing is. We're stressed out, so we come home. The kids are addicted to various types of media, whether it's video games, whether it's other kinds of media, um, whether it's their pagers. And then we try to go to sleep, but we're continuing to be stimulated because we're addicted. And then that leads to getting up the, the next day and being anxious at work again. And the cycle repeats, and the cycle repeats, and it becomes a bit of a downward spiral. In Eastern philosophy, yang, 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 yang. We have no yin. We have literally no moments. Well, what about those little between moments? Like, you know, going to the bathroom. Ah, well, I guess we already talk, talked to each other and told and admitted to each other that we check our social media feeds and get stimulated and advertised to while we're in the bathroom. 
What about those little moments at the bank where you know you would just sort of talk to the person in line or you would know the teller because you were coming in weekly to deposit your check? Gone. We do it at home by ourselves. Or if we do go to a bank for some crazy reason, we're glued to our phones. This is one of those things that I added on June 21st. Thank you, Savannah. <laughs> And I saw, sent her my new, I said, oh, I, I really would like this new one because I have a, a, a calendar of African proverbs. And I really do flip it every day. And on June 21st, I, I was, you know, going over my notes for this and I was looking at it. And it was a person never gets lost among people. We're not really among people that much anymore. And when we are among people, like we see in the upper right and the lower left, we're often having anxieties with those individuals that make us around people, but not really with people, which I would imagine is more of what the actual translation of this proverb is. A, a person never gets lost if they are emotionally with people. Are we emotionally with each other, even our spouses? I'm sure in some cases, yes. I'm not trying to take away anything from anyone, but a lot of this is societal. Okay, well, what about the positive? Come on, Brian. You know, social media helps us get stuff. And we, we, I did make a friend on social media. And some of the people that I play words with friends, you know, we, we actually have, you know, is shared emotional things with each other. There is good stuff. And yes, the answer is yes, there is good stuff. The problem is that the good stuff is often overshadowed by the difficult stuff. So let's talk about this a little bit. Um, in my mind, as I was doing all this research and I was getting very, very depressed about, you know, what was going, what we were possibly going to do is I thought to myself, all right, it's kind of like the 1950s and food research where people kept coming out with trans fats are bad, cis fats are bad, carbs are bad, you know, uh, everything's bad. And every once in a while there'd be, oh, fiber seems to be good. No, oh, protein might be good unless it's too much, in which case it'll give you this. Or... And what they eventually did was they said, all right, um, let's, uh, let's take a look and let's create like a pyramid that helps people remember what uh, to eat. I'm embarrassed that I have to do this, but time check quickly. I'm... Say again? Okay, perfect. So I set out to create a social media pyramid. The base of the pyramid, the best I could do is to be selective. Now that doesn't mean to necessarily to use less. Less is better, as we saw from one of our studies, but it also means other things that you can select. For example, we did a study looking at differences by number of platforms. Underneath on the x-axis here, we know the y-axis because we've seen that before, right? You know, odds of depression. Underneath, we have the number of platforms that you use in a given week. Some people use zero to two, some people use seven to 11. And in this study, very importantly, we controlled for the amount of time you use social media overall. So what that means is that we're comparing Let's say I use seven platforms a week. I use two hours a day, you know, kind of lower end, but I use seven different platforms because, you know, like Facebook or my work friends and in LinkedIn is, you know, I've got to always be looking for the next job. And, you know, um, Pinterest is my craft stuff and um, Reddit is how I get information and Twitter X is where I get news. Uh, news in quotes, um, et cetera, et cetera. And you use one or two platforms during those same two hours. So it's the same amount of time. Huge relationship. Wait, why? It's the same two hours. 
hey, man, why, why should it matter if you're trying to, you know, if you're using seven platforms versus one platform? And by the way, what if we look at anxiety? Same thing. This is why. If we try to have many, many different groups of friends, many, many different cultures around us, it's kind of like in high school. Like you couldn't really be, you know, friends with every single group in the breakfast club. You know, you couldn't be friends with the jocks and the theater kids and the math kids and et cetera, et cetera. That is kind of what happens in social media. This is a meme. Many of you know what memes are because you, you know, are in the right demographic. Many of you don't know what memes are. On the right side, you see when I accidentally use personality A with friend group B, which is taken from that last thing that we saw. On the other hand, we don't know if this was taken from this. There are entire sites that try to figure out what was the original meme? What was the original time that someone saw this? And then other people take that and they go to the next level with it. So on the right side, the guy is saying miles per hour and the antagonist is saying kilometers per hour. And then a friend of him is saying, how was the party? And he says, terrible. Or horrible, sorry. <laughs> On the left, nobody knows what these are, right? I'm the only one. They're Pokemon trainers. <laughs> I saw someone with a Pokemon. Uh, anyway, <laughs> they're Pokemon trainers. And so the, 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 uh, the, the woman on the left says, crawl up any good legs lately? Because she trains bug type Pokemon. But the people across from her who are other Pokemon trainers say, what? That's disgusting. And then uh, the bugs say to her, how was the party? Her allies. And she says, horrible. This describes the same basic ideas this did, which was that when we are not among the people that understand us, and when we don't understand what's going on, we have big problems. So you need to read this article before you go to Instagram or you're going to make mistakes. You need to read this if you're going to go to Wall Street Bets. You need, and you see the word need, you need to learn these. And that's not just Reddit, it's a specific subreddit. And if you don't, you're going to be more likely to make a gaffe, to make a fail, and then you're more likely to have problems. Okay, what else about selective? Well, who are your friends? What this study showed is that your odds of depression for every chunk of close friends that you are friends with on, on a social media, your odds of depression go down. But for anyone who you've not met face-to-face, they go up. I guess that makes sense. But not many people are, are friends with face-to-face. -face. It's about 40%. About 40% of the average person's um, social media contacts, they've never met face-to-face. -face. And for every one of those individuals, this study demonstrated that there are is a very, very large association, or not a, a large, but there is an association between um, every one of those individuals. And so that's something else we can select. We can call to focus on close friends as opposed to uh, collecting people that we don't necessarily know. And that makes sense because people that know us well know that we're not really the person on the left. They know that we're the person on the right. Whereas somebody that you don't know IRL in real life thinks that the person on the left really is you. All right, so selective, positive is the next chunk of the social media um, pyramid. Um, for example, are there differences by positive and negative experiences? 
Yes, there are. Because if you look at two hours of babies and puppies all day, you're going to be uh, different than if you look at two hours of politics and religion all day. Right? Yes. But this is what's interesting. And this is what we published in this study. The triangle is negative experiences. The square is positive experiences. The negative experiences outweigh the positive experiences. They're more powerful. Well, this is a known sociological phenomenon, negativity bias. And I like to call it the Tom Holland effect. Tom Holland, the beloved um, uh, star of the Spider-Man reboot movies, um, adorable guy, friendly, wonderful actor, talented. He came out and he said, I, I can't, I can't do social media anymore because of all the hate. 98% of what he gets is love. But those 2% negativity bias, he can't, he can't deal with it. And that's not his fault. Those are difficult, hateful things. And this is why a lot of people do take a break from social media. Social media, I like to say, is kind of like road rage in the sense that road rage is a thing because you're not seeing the human. Like if I just saw this woman walking down the street, I'm probably not going to butt up against her. I'm probably not going to cut in front of her, you know, in a line. But on the other hand, if it's not a human, if it's that mean red car, You know, I'll be more likely to say, hey, fella. <laughs> I'm not going to say what I might actually say. Um, and similarly, when we see social media and we have interactions like this, we are often um, not seeing the actual human. We're seeing the avatar, that mean avatar. Okay, last is creative. Let's look at things like personality type. Because presumably... You know, it's also, uh, you know, can I focus my social media on things that are more like me? Miss Piggy is probably very, very different in how she might use social media compared with Kermit the Frog. And this is the kind of thing that we see. If you look at relationships like um, social media use versus the odds of feeling lonely, uh, perceived social isolation, the squares are people with low conscientiousness. The triangles are people with high conscientiousness. What is conscientiousness? It's one of the big five personality characteristics that we use. And conscientiousness, it's kind of like being the opposite of lazy. Conscientiousness, I'm going to get it down, get it down, get it down. So what you can see here is that people who are more lazy, low conscientiousness. Okay, awesome. Thank you. <laughs> low conscientiousness are there's a strong relationship the more they use social media the higher their odds of feeling lonely whereas the people who are very conscientiousness or, or who have very high conscious con who are conscientious let's just say that when they use more social media use they're able to not feel lonely because they're able to conscientiously say i'm going to see people in other ways Last creative thing I want to talk about is um, related to a Kurt Vonnegut 1961 short story called Harrison Bergeron. In this futuristic dystopian society that he thought of, everyone had to be equal. And so what that meant was that if you were a graceful ballerina, you had to wear shackles and weights. If you were attractive, you had to wear masks. What about if you were intelligent? In this society, Yes, somebody was pointing here. You had little beeps. Randomly, it would beep in your head so that you couldn't think. That's what happens all day, right? It happened a couple times here. Now, for good reasons, but we don't, don't turn off our, you know, our alerts because we don't know how to or we don't have time or whatever. And so this is what happens all day. And this is related to a funny study that I saw recently. Um, the presence of your phone, even if it's powered off, takes away concentration and makes you unable to do certain activities. 
all right, can we achieve a healthy, healthy balance? I, I don't know. Right now, we're losing the battle to big tech. It becomes an ethical issue. What I would say is, in closing this, my final instructions to you are, don't look for me on social media. <clears throat> don't hit like. Don't subscribe to me or anything else. Don't click my bell for notifications. You may buy my book. <laughs> I do in the book talk about the social media pyramid, and there's a lot more stuff that is related to that. Um, but this is how I'll close. Highlighting that ethical question. Also, thanks to Savannah, because I added this two days ago because I was in the hotel room and I decided to watch the first episode of The Twilight Zone. I don't know why I did that. But in the first episode of The Twilight Zone, there's a guy who is very, very lonely. He wakes up, he doesn't know who he is, and he runs through this town and there's nobody there. And it gets frightening and frightening and more frightening until at the end of the 20 minutes or whatever, he is literally screaming in pain. And then he wakes up and he is in part of an experiment because he's in the Air Force getting ready for a, a, a voyage to the moon. Well, on the voyage to the moon and back, it's going to take two weeks in confinement. And so he's got to get used to that. And so he had this horrible nightmare about being alone. And the author's message here is what the doctor says. When he says, what happened to me, doc? He wakes up. What happened to me? Did I go off my rocker? He says, you see, Ferris, we can feed stomachs with concentrates. We can supply microfilm for recreation, reading, even movies of a sort. We can pump oxygen in, waste material out. But there's one thing we can't simulate that's a basic need. Man's hunger for companionship, the barrier of loneliness. That's one we haven't licked yet. And I would encourage you to think ethically, is the society that we're in right now one that we should be okay with? Or should we be questioning it and trying to make our world more like this? Thank you very much.